Okay, the train is leaving the station. The ship is pulling away from the pier. Uh, Rob Kaiser, uh, Rob. <laughs> Ryan Sherman is going to give Professor Sloan a proper introduction. I just wanted to set some context for this conversation because he's a, he's a sort of different kind of cat from what we normally have around here. Uh, so I've always been interested in biology. Uh, and I thought that's the foundation for everything. And the best paper I read in graduate school was, a, was an essay by a British biologist named Evans Pritchard in which he argued that characteristics that there are characteristics that, are, that whole groups exhibit that are good for the group, maybe not good for the individual, but allow that group to out. Evolution can operate at the group level as well as the individual level, and it has to do with group, group characteristics. I thought that was just a terrific idea. It made enormous good sense to me because I've been my whole life I've been interested in morality, where morality comes from, how you justify it, blah, blah, blah. I taught a course in psychology and moral development for like 40 years. And I've thought a lot about morality. It's a real puzzle. Where does it, why should you follow the rules? Because God said so? Well, what if you're not a believer? Then, then you know, what is justification for the rules? And there's this great insight in Freud who says, uh, you know, all morality amounts to renunciation. Making, you have to do things you don't want to do or you have to not do things you want to do. And that's what morality, so morality exact, if you're a moral person, it exacts penalties at the individual level. It's renunciation. So I go, how can that be? Why, people are basically self-serving, how can it be? The answer is, it finally dawned on me, was that morality is good for the group, it's not good for the individual. Morality is what allows the group to function at a high level. And, and it, so it's the price you have to pay to live in society if you have to play by the rules, but it's because it's good for the group, not for you. Well, that's an, uh, that's an understanding that eludes most psychologists. So, he says in his notes here, uh, 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 group selection, Evans Pritchard, is un unavailable, uh, uh, un unavoidable and incomprehensible to most people. So there's a guy named Richard Dawkins who uh, published a book in the, uh, 1972 uh, called The Selfish Gene, which is an all-out attack on, on group selection. And, and that has become the Bible. That's become the Bible. That's become the, the, the political politically correct position to take, that group selection doesn't exist in principle. So, uh, Professor Wilson, has, I've, I've, who, with whom I've been corresponding since he was a graduate student in the middle 70s, and we've never met, but we've had talked over it. I've followed his career from a distance because I think he's a genuine hero. He has been the bulldog, the advocate for this position called group, se group selection, or multi-level selection theory. And he's done that in the teeth of furious professional criticism. I'm sure he put your career at risk for doing that. He's an honest to God moral hero. I mean, he really is. I don't know, I, I mean, you can't imagine the kind of report group you can uh, suffer in academia if you get out of step. And he's been out of step this whole course. I think he's, I've always thought he was right. I think the world is slowly coming around his point of view. I wanted to invite him here just so we could say that we appreciate his, his, his courage and his intellectual integrity, but he is a real modern hero. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Okay, introduction number two, uh, the uh, more tactical uh, introduction. So uh, D David Sloan Wilson is an evolutionary biologist uh, by training. He's at SUNY uh, Binghamton. Uh, he's a distinguished professor of biological sciences and anthropology. He received his PhD in 1975 from Michigan State University, and he has uh, traveled the world at working at various universities and research institutes. Um, before uh, ultimately uh, getting to Binghamton and becoming a full professor there. Uh, he also started the Evolutionary Studies Program at Binghamton. Uh, as uh, R.T. said, he's best known for his research on, uh, or his theoretical position on multi-level selection theory. He's also done a, a lot of research on personality and non-human animals. Um, on these topics, he's written more than 350 articles, books, and book chapters. Some of his books are featured here. Um, he's also the president of the Evolution Institute, uh, which is an institute dedicated to uh, promoting public policy from an evolutionary perspective. And uh, these are some of the ideas that I'm sure he'll be talking about today, including um, how evolutionary principles uh, can inform organizations and, and business decisions. Um, his newest book, which is This View of Life, uh, appears there on the screen. Um, it, yeah, subtitle, uh, Completing the Darwinian Revolution. Uh, it is out and uh, we have a copy that will be in the library that you can all uh, check out later uh, uh, just to see your local librarian um, 
And one of my favorite quotes uh, that, uh, that David and one of his co-authors uh, uh, wrote some years ago was selfishness beats altruism within groups, <coughs> altruistic groups, groups beat selfish groups, everything else is commentary. And I think uh, that's a, a really nice uh, central thesis for, for what we're going to hear about today. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. David Wilson. <laughs> Thanks for both of those introductions. Yes, the group selection controversy continues. There has been a lot of progress, but just this morning, um, uh, my newest article on the topic was published in our online magazine, This View of Life. Uh, if any of you have heard of Brett Weinstein, uh, The Intellectual Dark Web, uh, my article is entitled, uh, What Brett Weinstein Gets Wrong About Group Selection. So uh, you can check that out, and you'll get a little bit taste of that, uh, taste of that today. Well, I speak in front of uh, uh, so many different audiences that my default assumption is is that nobody knows me from Adam. So like uh, Jimmy Durandy, I have to say I'm not in who's who, but I am in what's that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I want to give you a little bit of an introduction, not just to myself, but to the intellectual trends that have taken place. Because we live in a very exciting time, have been for quite a while. And uh, so all kinds of things are happening in the world of ideas uh, that uh, I want to uh, summarize, a really big picture. And I also want to uh, praise this organization for being so research-based. I've learned enough about organizations and corporations to know that uh, no, seldom do they have the kind of commitment to scientific research that, uh, that this one does. And so it's a real pleasure for me to be working with a group that includes, not restricted to, but includes um, academic research, and it really makes that a foundation for what they do in the real world. That's what I'm trying to do through the Evolution Institute, and I am a newbie. I am a newbie, so uh, I'm, uh, I've always felt I've been pretty good at recognizing when I'm functioning in the capacity of a teacher and when I'm functioning in the capacity of a student, and I know that I'm a student here in many uh, respects. So I was trained as an evolutionary ecologist. I began by studying aquatic uh, creatures. It was in the 1970s, as R.T. Uh, said, and uh, that was a very synthetic period in evolutionary thought. That's when Theodosius Dajansky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. That's when uh, Ed Wilson published uh, Sociobiology, and I just learned from R.T. that that book depressed him because it was the book that he wanted to write. <laughs> and so the idea that, that, uh, that social behavior in all species could be approach from the same theoretical perspective. That was the exciting prospect, that in evolutionary theory we had a toolkit, a set of ideas that could be used to study any aspect of any species. It was a passport to the study of all species. And throughout my uh, beginning of my career, when I studied mostly non-human species, I used my passport to study a whole menagerie of, of species and behaviors, and one of those was uh, personality differences in fish with my wife, Ann Clark, who we were pioneered the study of individual differences in non-human uh, species. But you know, the interpretation is really simple. We tend to think of species as homogenous units, but we know that in communities and ecosystems, there's many species, and, and the reason that there are so many species is because they survive and reproduce in different ways many ways to survive and reproduce in nature. And uh, basically, the concept of, it, of individual differences within a species merely notes that species are not homogenous after all. There's many ways to survive and reproduce within a species in addition to between species. And so that provides a basis for studying such things as shyness and boldness or sensitivity to experience or so on and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Another major topic is uh, phenotypic plasticity, the fact that individuals, in addition to being uh, distinctively different from other individuals, that's what we mean by personality and temperament, also have an impressive capacity to change during their lifetimes. And here we have a, a species of snail which actually is able to sense its environment, cues from its environment, and in the absence of uh, fish predators, it develops into this body form here, which is basically the, the optimal body form for foraging. And in the presence of predators, which it senses by chemical cues, it develops a more spherical shape, um, which is the best shape for predator um, um, uh, protection. 
And so the idea that all species, to a degree, have evolved to change during the course of their lifetimes um, is um, as true as individual differences. So that sets up the, one of the themes of my talk here when we apply it to humans, is that it's hard to know what to be more impressed by, our individual differences or our capacity to change. And whatever we do in the real world has to reflect both of those uh, things in an intelligent in an intelligent, uh, an intelligent way. Well, yes, I'm uh, best known for multi-level selection theory, and the best way that I can explain it is with the game of Monopoly. So here's a game you've all played, and you know the object of that game. So get yourself in a Monopoly mood, which is to uh, get all the property for yourself and drive all the other players bankrupt, okay? And so now imagine playing a slightly different game, which is a Monopoly tournament. So now there's many boards in progress, and the trophy goes to the team that collectively develops their property the fastest. I've actually done this with uh, science club students, and it was so wonderful to have them first play the single game and then play the tournament and to see the transition in their behavior. And I think that you can see that uh, with only a little thought that nearly every decision you make as a team player will be different than playing the regular game of Monopoly. Isn't that amazing? Almost every decision you make as an individual trying to beat other individuals within your group is going to be different than those decisions that you would make to work with your group to outcompete other groups. Competition is still taking place, but it's taking place at a different level, at a different level. And so that, in a nutshell, is multi-level selection theory. Evolution is like this. So an evolution is taking place among individuals within groups, and that's tending to evolve behaviors that are like the single game of monopoly that we would recognize as disruptively self-serving in human terms. And natural selection offer also operates between groups, and that's like the monopoly tournament. It results in, 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 in groups that behave in a coordinated fashion. Teamwork. So one point about this is teamwork does not come for free. If you go out in nature, it is not the case that social groups or much less biological ecosystems function well as units. There's so many species out there which would be called despotic in human terms, societies that we would not want to live in. Life's a bitch and then you die societies. Only some societies work well as societies. And is it any surprise that that's also true in our own species, that there's some groups in which we would not want to live in those groups, and other groups in which we definitely would want to live in. Special conditions are required in nature, and special conditions are required in our uh, groups. And this is profoundly different than the concept of the invisible hand that's so pervasive in economics over the last century, which supposes that the, that the pursuit of self-interest, the pursuit of lower level self-interest robustly benefits the common good, that if individuals pursue their gains, if corporations prefer, pursue their short-term profits, then somehow this is all going to work out well for the economy as a whole. That is profoundly not the case, not the case. There's actually more interesting versions of the invisible hand, which uh, happy to talk about, but not, not that one. That's the most toxic idea. Um, I call that the morality of the cancer cell. Yes. <laughs> Cancer cells will tell you, uh, look how fast I'm growing. Everyone should grow as fast as me. And so we can stretch this out. What I've talked about for individuals within groups actually exists in a multi-tiered hierarchy. So what's good for me can be bad for my family. What's good for my family can be bad for my clan. What's good for my clan can be bad for my nation. What's good for my corporation can be bad for, my, for the economy, so on and so forth. So there's a general rule that we can apply, both in nature and in human society. That adaptation at any given level for some social unit at any scale to work well, there must be a process of selection at that scale, at that scale. And lower level selection will tend to disrupt that, will tend to disrupt that. You can apply that at every rung of a multi-tier social um, hierarchy. So multi-level selection, there could not be a more consequential theory than multi-level selection for um, all things uh, human. 
So now let's make that segue, basically. Uh, we have uh, the study of genetic evolution. What about evolution in human affairs? And Darwin, if you go back and read Darwin, it's quite amazing that way back then, he was convinced that that theory of his could explain the length and breadth of, morale of, of humanity in addition to the um, natural world, including morality. He thought deeply about morality, and for the most part, he got it right. He said more or less what you just, just uh, did. But nevertheless, the history of evolution in relation to human affairs followed a very different path than in the biological sciences, and for the most part, experienced a case of arrested development during most of the 20th century. In the first place, the study of, of, of evolution became highly gene-centric. Once genes were discovered and the science of genetics developed, it was as if all of evolution was genetic evolution. Around the world, when you say the word evolution, people hear the word genes as if the only way that offspring can resemble their parents is to share genes. And yet we know that it's patently not the case. Parents and offspring share their language, and their language is not genetically based. Nevertheless, the study of culture was ceded to other disciplines during that period. And it was only during, well, back to E.O. Wilson, Sociobiology, 1975, the new synthesis, celebrated as a triumph for the rest of life, and yet the last chapter on humans created a storm of controversy. So 1975 is like a, a place marker in the fact that it was still not permitted, taboo, to study humans the way we wanted to study the rest of life. And so terms such as evolutionary psychology, anthropology, economics, weren't coined until the 80s or 90s and still had the whiff of scandal about them. And so uh, this just shows you how how, um, how applying evolution to human affairs is new. Despite the fact that Darwin's theory is pretty old, this study is, is only a few decades um, um, uh, old. Thankfully, we're back on track. And so, uh, so here's the good news and the bad news. Uh, the good news is now it is back on track, and so there's just the most wonderful community publishing books, accessible books for a broad audience, articles in the best journals, all that that are studying, uh, like Darwin, all aspects of humanity in addition to the natural world. The bad news is that this community is still a tiny fraction of the academic community. And more bad news, almost invisible to the whole world of policy making. Everyone is trying to actually put these ideas to use in the real world. It is, you might say, almost um, entirely absent. And that's what I mean by completing the Darwinian revolution. The, the Darwinian revolution will not be complete until it makes sense of everything associated with the words human, culture, and policy in addition to biology. The means are at hand, and yet we simply need to catalyze this. It's not in the future. There's actually a community that's already doing it, but it needs to be um, catalyzed. So what are some of these new tools in the policy makers toolkit? In the first place, I define policy very broadly. That's not just government policy. A policy is a course or principle of action adopted or proposed by a government party, business, or individual. So you guys are in the process of formulating and implementing wise uh, a policy. So here's some of the some of the new tools in the in the um, in the uh, toolkit. Number one, there's more to evolution than genetic evolution. As I've said, all of the fast-paced changes taking place around us that includes cultural change and personal change, because every one of us is an open-ended individual, our evolutionary processes that can benefit from the same toolkit developed to study genetic evolution. Symbolic thought as an inheritance system. Do you know that cultural traditions exist in many species, but they're not very flexible as evolutionary processes? What makes humans in a class of themselves, as far as our capacity for cultural evolution, is that we are capable of symbolic thoughts. Every one of you is a collection of genes and a symbolic system, which governs how you are just as much as your genes. And so we have uh, two inheritance systems, just our symbolic systems, our meaning systems, and our genes, which have been co-evolving with each other for a very long time. And of course, evolution of, of symbolic systems can be so much faster. And so change often, both individual change, therapy, or training, or organizational change as a matter of actually working with our symbolic 
system. So much depends on how you look at it. How you look at it. Is the theory that decides what you can observe, or is the worldview that decides what you can observe? So the idea of thinking of, of meaning systems of all sorts, religious plus otherwise, as a kind of a inheritance system, subject to rapid evolution, is just really, it's hard to think of something more exciting than, than uh, that. Evolution is the problem in addition to the solution. Evolution does not make everything nice. Often evolution results in behaviors that benefit me, not you. We see that as individual selfishness. That's not them. Being nice to your family is good. Nepotism is bad. Being nice to your friends is good. Cronyism is, is bad. Profiting as a corporation is good, not but might be bad for the economy. Economic growth is good, except for global uh, warming. And so, so much that we regard as pathological, and is pathological in the normative sense of the word, actually is adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word. And so what that means is we must become wise managers of evolutionary processes. Work is required to align these fast-paced evolutionary processes so that they promote our normative goals. If we don't do that, evolution will still take place, but it will take us where we don't want to go. So there is no alternative to becoming wise managers of evolutionary uh, processes. Then there's evolutionary mismatches, which are maladaptive in every sense of the word. Evolution can only adapt us to our past environments. If the environment changes in a way which is, does not reflect variation in the past, then all of our adaptations can become pathological in every sense of the word. I don't know if you can see this, but what it is, it's a, it's a beetle trying to mate with a beer bottle. <laughs> and that's not good for the beetle in any sense. Why is that? It's because you can't see it very well, but the, the elytra, the shell of the beetle, has these little dimples on it. And so does the, the beer bottle. And so as far as this beetle is concerned, that's the biggest, sexiest female he has ever, <laughs> ever seen. He's the happiest beetle that there, can, that there can be. And the solution is pretty easy, by the way. Just take those dimples away, and you'll solve that. Problem. Not so obesity, not such an easy problem to solve, and a hundred other maladies that we call diseases of civilization. You know, there's a whole suite of diseases which are more prevalent in wealthy nations than they are in unwealthy nations. How is that possible? How is that possible? It's possible because it's the developed nations where we've had the greatest alterations of our environments. And these can be so subtle. It could have to do with our lighting environment, for example. There's so many different ways in which we have created mismatches. Even while solving some problems, we can create mismatches for others, not just for ourselves, but for the rest of life on Earth. And so when you take, basically, things that count as adaptive in the evolutionary sense of the word, but they're socially pathological, or things that are mismatches and therefore definitely pathological, most of what we see as pathological is something that we need to understand from an evolutionary uh, 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 perspective. Now, another thing that needs to be done a little bit more technical is reuniting evolutionary psychology and the standard social science model. And here we get, I wish I could talk about it a little bit more at length, but I, I just can't for lack of time. Happy to do it in a, in a, in a Q&A. But the history of psychology, which you know well, is uh, very conflicted. Uh, we have, for example, such things as the rise and fall of behaviorism. And then we have the cognitive revolution. And then we have evolutionary psychology and the thesis of massive modularity. And at that time, uh, uh, Cosmiti and Tooby and Steve Pinker and those folks made a deliberate contrast between evolutionary psychology, which was basically about special purpose adaptations that evolved by genetic evolution, and what they call the standard social science model, the blank slate tradition of Skinner and, and, uh, and uh, cultural anthropologists, which celebrated the idea of flexibility, basically, that individuals are capable of open-ended change and cultures are capable of open-ended change. So there was a whole period of time in which that was basically branded as something that was false in some sense. And then we had to basically, massive modularity was supposed to be the picture of all of, of uh, psychology. And that turns out to be you know, deeply erroneous and something which was a flaw that was built in at the very beginning 
on evolutionary psychology, you have to say something. No, larger. I just I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so uh, and so the really good metaphor, I think, the correct way to think about our behavioral system, our capacity to um, to respond behaviorally to our environment, is that it's like the immune system. And the immune system is well known to have two components, what's called an innate component, which is densely modular and does not change during our lifetime, and the adaptive component, which is our antibodies, which are capable of evolving during the course of our lifetime. And so if that's the kinds of these two components of our adaptations to fight disease organisms inside our body, our behavioral system has to be at least that complex and the idea that we have all of these modules that evolve by genetic evolution and get triggered, for example, fear, if I instill fear in you, then you're going to be using different circuits, and if I don't, if you feel safe and secure versus fearful and a trustworthy environment versus a non-trustworthy environment, so on and so on and so forth. A lot of that is automatic, automatic. And yet at the same time, we're incredibly open-ended in being what B.F. Skinner calls selection by consequences. A lot of what we see out there is a product of incentives, basically. We do it because we were rewarded to, to do it. And we'll do just about anything that's, that's rewarded. So, I mean, capitalism goes wrong in part for that incentive. The incentives for the opioid industries, smoking, sugar, guns, all of this kind of stuff, is basically an incentive structure gone, gone uh, amok. And these organizations, people and organizations, you can't blame them in a sense. They're being selected by consequences. And what we need to do is we need to, we need to engineer those consequences in order to produce the right, uh, the right uh, consequences. And so uh, now here's an example, one of my favorite examples uh, from the uh, field of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is one of the most science-based methods of, uh, of mindfulness-based therapy, which is broadly derived from the Skinnerian tradition, but with much more attention to symbolic thought. And this was a study of uh, K-12 teachers responding to a wellness program. These are people teaching your kids. 75% uh, were about clinical cutoffs for general mental health, depression, anxiety, or stress. Uh, this was a randomized weightless treatment. And the treatment was just to read a book, a self-help book on acceptance and commitment uh, therapy. And so what we see is, is that here's the group that read it first. Here's the post, an improvement, and the other group read it, we get improvement. Here's the part I love best, the difference between post and follow-up for the first group, because not only, so nothing happened here after post, they read the book. They could have stayed the same or they could have relapsed, but they got better, they got better. And so what happened was that they, by reading the book, they had internalized something that was useful to them, and then they had practiced it and they got better at it. And so and there's, there's many studies that, that uh, show this. So this is just a hint that we actually have efficacious practices for causing people to work towards their valued goals, to overcome obstacles, to avoid the short-sighted things which are adaptive in, in the evolutionary sense of the word, and then to actually, to actually align their learning uh, and psychological processes in order to reach their short-term goals. And those same, te those same techniques, by the, uh, do you know, also work for organizations. What works for groups can also work for, for um, um, organizations. And so, uh, okay, uh, more tools for the policymaker uh, toolkit. Homo sapiens is an ultra-social uh, species. Here's a chimp society on an average day. The act of regression, the kind of regression where people lose a ten and someone loses, a, loses their temper and just lashes out in, in rage, happens a hundred to a thousand times more frequently in a chip society than in a human society. For, for the most part, you see much better um, uh, behavior. Of course, uh, human groups are capable of great violence against other groups. That's typically of the, of the proactive variety, the cool calculated Variety. So isn't it paradoxical that on the one hand we have such great control, especially within a small group, against that kind of behavior, and yet we're also even specialists at being uh, proactively aggressive against other 
our groups. And the reason that we're able to do this is in large part because of moral systems. So what RT, what you just said about moral systems is nothing more or less than the social physiology that causes cooperation and forces cooperation among groups. It has a coercive side, which you emphasized, but it also has a voluntary side. And in a strong moral system, not only do we have norms that we respect, but we also genuinely want to help other people. Why is that? It's because the coercive side has provided a safe social environment so that you actually can be an altruist, a genuine altruist, and you will not be exploited thanks to the coercive side of the morality coin. And so there's a whole literature on morality from this perspective, which is much like what you, what you um, uh, described. And so the idea of society as an organism, a metaphor which goes back to antiquity, Aristotle, Hobbes, many of the early social psychologists uh, employed that metaphor. Uh, we, uh, this is no longer a metaphor, basically. The concept of an organism as a society and a society as an organism provides a genuine alternative to the, um, um, to the intellectual tradition of, uh, of individualism. I wanted to illustrate this. How am I doing on time, by the way? We're good? 25, still. Good, okay. Um, um, with the work of uh, this guy named Jim Cohen. He's a clinical neuroscientist at the University of Virginia. And he's developed something called social baseline theory. And here's how he came up with it. He was treating a World War II veteran who was uh, suffering from late onset post-traumatic stress disorder. And the old gentleman was not responding to any kind of treatment, wouldn't do anything that Jim asked him to do. And, uh, and then he said, I want my wife with me. And Jim had never had this request before, but he said, okay. At first he treated his wife as a bystander, and then his wife said, and, and the gentleman was no more, more uh, um, compliant than, uh, than before. And then his wife said, uh, let me hold his hand. And so they held hands, and he opened up to therapy, became even more receptive than most of his other patients. And so Jim was amazed. And he embarked upon a set of experiments in which he would take people, everyday people, and he put them in an fMRI machine so he could look at what was going on in their brains. And he would strap electrodes to their ankle and he'd put them under threat of electric shock, which was very stressful. And, and he did that under three circumstances. Alone, holding the hand of a stranger, and holding the hand of a loved one. And he found that holding the hand of a loved one had a tremendous calming effect. And so he had duplicated, basically, the uh, example of the man and his, and his wife. And so this led him to think, you know, what was the one constant in human evolution? All of our different groups, all of their different ecological niches, all of those different climatic zones, what's the one constant of human evolution was to be always, almost always, in the midst of a highly cooperative group? And this is, has gone on for so long that our brains have evolved not to distinguish bet between our personal resources and our social resources. The brain doesn't even tell the difference. When the brain is making its trade-off decisions, of course, it has to have resources in order to do that. But as to whether those resources are personal resources or social resources, the brain factors those in seamlessly. And here's a, an experiment that demonstrates that. Uh, this is a work done by Jim's uh, colleague, uh, Dennis uh, uh, Prophet. So imagine that I take you to the base of this hill, and I ask you to estimate its slope. So you do. And then I do that under different conditions, before and after fasting, before and after a workout, with or without a uh, heavy backpack. And as I deplete your personal resources, of course you're less inclined to climb the hill. But isn't it funny, a funny thing about our minds is that we also actually perceive the hill as steeper. We don't want to climb it because it actually looks steeper to us. That's the way our mind works. It didn't have to be that way, but that is the way our minds work. And so against that background, I had a fourth condition, I, with or without a friend standing next to you. And with the friend, you say, let's climb that hill. That hill doesn't look steep at all. And so your mind has factored in a social resource along with your personal resources, and we don't even know 
the difference. And so what that means is, is that the natural human social environment is to be embedded in a small, cooperative, trusting group. And when we're not in that situation, as so often we are not, then we've got all of these pathologies of loneliness and isolation and so on and so forth, because it's really a little bit like removing an ant from the ant colony. Obviously, there's big differences between a social insect colony and a human group, but we're enough of an ultra-social species that the way we think, the way our minds work, really was designed to operate in the context of being a member of a small cooperative group. And isn't that a prescription for, for uh, a policy, basically? In so many different contexts, the best thing you can do is to get people operating in small groups. And those groups can be the cells, the cells of a multicellular uh, organism. We can do that in a corporate setting, and we can also do that in any other, in any other uh, uh, setting. <laughs> and so starting about 10 years ago, uh, I uh, became involved in this kind of research, basically leaving the ivory tower and trying to implement this uh, evolutionary view in a real world setting through my nonprofit, the uh, Evolution Institute, now 10 years old, and so not too bad, a dollar we should be much bigger. Um, and, uh, and some of our early work, our work often focuses on pro-sociality, any uh, attitude, behavior, or organization, or any person, welfare of others, or society as a whole. I've already said it's likely to be a master variable. A lot of research actually indicates if you, if you live in a pro-social environment, you have multiple assets. If you don't, you have multiple liabilities, especially as you're going. Um, up. And so if there could be only one policy prescription, it would be to increase pro-sociality in all of its forms. One of the first things I did was I worked with our public school system to give a survey measuring individual differences in pro-sociality in all of the public school students. And we were able to geotag them to a residential location, and we were able to produce this map. This is the city of Binghamton. And the dark areas represent neighborhoods in which most of the kids are high pro-social, and the low areas are neighborhoods in which they're not. And on a scale of, on a scale of uh, 1 to 100, an individual scale where an individual could score from 1 to 100, the neighborhoods varied by as much as 50 points. And so now, I mean, I think you know enough. How can pro-sociality, how can a high pro-individual succeed in a Darwinian world? by surrounding themselves with other high pros. That's how. To the degree which high pros and low pros become clustered into different social groups, that's the degree to which pro-sociality pro can evolve. That's what we're seeing here. If you actually measure the pro-sociality of the individual with the pro-sociality of their social environment, including not just their neighborhood, but their family, school, um, uh, church, and extracurricular activities, you find a correlation coefficient of 0 0.7, 0 0.7 between the prosociality of the individual and the prosociality of their social environment. And if you ask the question about these individual differences, you know, are they temperamental or are they situational? Back to behavioral flexibility versus uh, uh, personality differences. The answer, of course, will be both. But there's a tremendously, as I, I'm about to show a flexible component. One thing I often say is, imagine you're a high pro, you really want to be pro-social, but you're in an environment where everyone around you is low pro, so what are you going to do? Number one, you could leave. Maybe. Number two, you could try to convert those around you, turn them from low pro to high pro. Number two, you can turn off your pro-sociality and become low pro to protect yourself. Or number four, you could remain a high pro and suffer the consequences. Those are the only four options I know. And who would counsel the individual to pick option four, to remain pro-social and suffer the consequences? The idea that we counsel people to be pro-social and then we put them out into a world where pro-social can be exploited is unethical. It's unethical. So unless you work on the social environment, and be very careful as to how you counsel the individual to change. But if you provide a social environment, as we will see, because the next thing we did was we started to work in the schools. We had an opportunity to create a school for at-risk children. These are kids that had flunked three or more of their courses in their previous year, and these were definitely low pros 
basically in terms of how they were responding to their, to their lives. But we built in, using principles I'm about to describe, a basically a really good nurturing social environment that made it safe to be pro-social. And so what, what's likely to happen? There's no way to predict that because if you think about phenotypic plasticity, our, our evolved behavioral flexibility, it spans the gamut from things that happen early in life and then become fixed. You know that that can happen. There's even prenatal effects that can become uh, fixed. All the way to a chameleon-like ability to toggle back and forth between behaviors depending upon the circumstances. There's a whole range of phenotypically plastic mechanisms. And we simply don't know if we take a kid who grew up in a harsh environment all the way up now they're in high school, and if all of a sudden we provide a nice environment, will they respond? We don't know. We have to do the experiment. And as it turns out, they did. So the, the Regents Academy students, not only on the, on the state exams that everyone takes, so it was a good so it's a good measure, not only did much, much better than the comparison group, but even performed on a par with the uh, average high school student in the city of, of Binghamton. So this is the power of individuals capable of changing if you change their social environment, but not otherwise. Not otherwise. And this really speaks to the need, I think, of, and we get in the business of advising groups of all kinds, including corporations, to work on the social environment and not just on the selection of individuals who are going to enter a social environment. So one of the things I'm eager to talk about and have, did talk about over lunch is to what extent is Hogan in that business? Or is it in the business of basically taking the social environment of a corporation as a given and then just helping that company recruit people into that social uh, environment? But I think you can see the scope of, for improvement in on working on the, uh, the uh, uh, social environment. So this person, Eleanor Ostrom, is famous in some quarters, but not in others. Um, I usually ask uh, how many people have you heard of, of her, and invariably I get a 10 or 15% of people raising their hands. Uh, she's a political scientist, and she won the Nobel Prize in Economics um, in uh, 2009. What she studied was the famous tragedy of the commons. I bet you've all heard of that. The idea that when, when a group of individuals is drawing upon some common pool resource, there's tend to be um, um, uh, a tendency to over-exploit. Public goods games uh, are, are, uh, are, this could be duplicated in public goods games in the, uh, in the uh, laboratory. But what uh, Lynn Lostrom did was she actually studied groups that, that utilized common pool resources. She showed that they varied in how well they avoided the tragedy of the commons, and the best of those uh, um, implemented certain core design principles. And so her achievement was to identify these uh, core design principles that enable groups to manage their common pool resources. Okay, and that was her achievement that won the Nobel Prize. And so without any further ado, here they are. You can think of this as a blueprint, at least for some kinds of groups. And as I show them to you, please have a group in mind, any group, even Hogan. That's a group. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the groups, and again, I do another time check. I don't want to overstep my time. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay, we're good. Okay. So, groups that function well, number one, had a strong sense of identity and purpose. They knew that they were a group, that the group was important, who was in the group, what resource they had available to them, who was qualified to draw upon the resource. Two, fair distribution of costs and benefits. Not sustainable for some members of the group to get the benefits and for other members to support the cost. There has to be some sense in which what you give to the group is proportional to what you get from the group. Decision making should be fair and inclusive. Not sustainable if some members of the group get to make the decisions and other members are cut out of that decision. Need not be consensus, strict consensus based. There has to be some sense in which the group feels that the decision making is um, fair and and inclusive, basically decisions are being made for the welfare of the whole group, not just for some individuals at the expense of others. Number four, agreed upon behaviors. If you can't know if you're behaving in, as you're supposed to, then all bets are off. Number five, graduated sanctions for misbehaviors. If you're not behaving as you should, something needs to be done about it, but it need not start out 
harsh. Typically a friendly reminder is enough. All of us often fail to do what we're expected to do, largely because of competing demands. Friendly reminder, often sufficient, but it must be possible to escalate um, when uh, needed. Number six, fast and fair conflict resolution. Conflicts will occur, they need to be resolved quickly, and in a manner that's regarded as fair by all parties. Fairness, fairness, fairness. Inclusiveness is a hallmark of all of these. Number seven, authority to self-govern. If you're being bossed around from the outside, then you can't do any of these other things. So local autonomy, authority to self-govern is, um, is huge. And number eight, appropriate relations with other groups, which reflect the same principles. And this is so important, because what it means is, is that these core design principles are scale independent. They are needed to govern relations among groups just in the same way as relations among individuals within groups. And so this allows us to expand beyond the single group level to the multicellular society um, uh, level. So those are the eight core design principles that enable common pool resource groups to function well. And I think you can see just on the basis of this brief exposure how well they map on to multi-level selection theory. Basically, in a group that implements these core design principles, it's very hard to play the single game of monopoly. Just try and see what happens. Whereas, and so therefore, that puts you into teamwork mode. It's safe to be a team player when these core design principles are implemented. In a group where these core design principles are not in place, then those are ripe for exploitation. And even if you're not an exploiter, you're really good at sussing out the situation and know how exploitable is this situation and then pulling away, basically pulling into your shell, withholding your own pro-social uh, tendencies if you know that it's dangerous for you to extend, your, um, extend yourself. And so uh, I worked with Eleanor Ostrom for three years uh, before her death in 2012 and we basically we generalized the core design principles from an evolutionary uh, perspective. So it's very important to stress that not all common pool resource groups functioned well. They vary. That's why Len Ostrom was able to, to uh, uh, formulate these core design principles. And our bold prediction is, is that when Ostrom showed for one type of group, it should hold for all types of groups. For any kind of group, including business groups, they should vary in how well they function, and this variation should be largely explained by how well they implement the core design principle. And so we have, uh, now so if we think about business groups, uh, it would seem that uh, business groups require cooperation more than most kinds of groups, but there's a widespread impression that business groups need to operate according to a different set of uh, rules. And the, uh, the uh, economist Herb Gintis has a great quote here about homo economist, the uh, economicus. <clears throat> the imagined human, a mere classical economic. Homo economicus has no emotions. He's totally interested in maximizing his wealth and income. He really doesn't care about other people, although he does care about leisure. Leisure, income, and wealth are the only thing. When they taught this to business school students, it obviously followed that if you're a good businessman, you should just maximize your material wealth. This is greedy. Being greedy is human. It's good to do, and the more greedy you are, more successful you'll be. So there's a whole ethos. Talk about symbotypes. Talk about symbolic systems and what they, how they make sense of the, of the world. I think one of the problems with business groups is because this heavy, heavy influence of this homo economicus thinking, which basically causes us to other things, other things make sense. And so what's common sense from a multi-level evolutionary perspective becomes invisible from a uh, this other, uh, uh, this other uh, perspective. But here's real data here. This is a survey, some survey research we've done. Um, I won't go into the details because I'm going fast. I'm happy to cover the details. But basically on the y-axis, we have how well does a group implement the core design principles. On the x-axis, we have the measure of group performance. In this case, it's a trust score. <coughs> See, we great fit. Okay? The better the group implements the core design principles, the better it performs. Uh, the red dots are, or the blue dots are business groups. 
and the red dots are any other kind of group. So we're comparing business groups with a diversity of other groups. And the take homes are uh, group performance strongly correlates with the implementation of the core design principles. Uh, that's true for business groups, they fall on the same line as the other kind of groups. And although some business groups function well, as we work down the line, we see mostly business groups. So there's something about business groups that are especially deficient in the core design principles. We can drill down and we can actually see uh, this data set is large enough, so business groups are deficient in all of the core <laughs> design principles, but the standouts are local autonomy. Basically, many people feel that they can't do their job if they think their job should be done. Decision making, they're cut out of the decision making process and sense of identity and purpose. They just don't give a rat's ass about the objectives of their, of their businesses. There's no nobility or anything like that in, in, in their uh, workplace, at least as they, at least as they uh, uh, see it. Well, I can't come to Hogan without talking about personality differences. And so here's just one study that uh, maybe you know this study already, but uh, it was a study of college students participating for credit in an intro psych class. And they were led to believe that they were leading a team of three other students during a verbal problem solving task. And, uh, and uh, if their group performed better, then they had incentives to do that. But also, and as leader, they could control how other members of the group interacted to various degrees. So they could basically control how the group was uh, uh, structured depending, to various degrees depending on the version of the experiment. And they were also told that one member of the group was especially talented in the task, and so this was there for a rival for leadership, okay? And then, uh, so, and the student's role as a leader was secure in some version, and, uh, and uh, but at risk in others, subject to a vote by other group members. And then finally, using something called an achievement motivation scale, which you might well already be familiar with, they were able to measure two uh, kinds of motivation. Dominance motivation, just a desire to be dominant, and prestige motivation, a desire to be respected, basically. And so there's your personality difference. And so the results were that when the leadership role was at risk, students that scored high in dominance motivation but not prestige motivation undermined the performance of the group to remain in the leadership uh, position. They, they, made, they made decisions which clearly was designed to keep them in the leadership position and compromise group performance. We're happy to do that in a number of ways. And all of this were incredibly low stress incredibly low stakes, they still did it. They were basically, those were their true color, is that they were in this to stay in power, and they were going to do that regardless of how well the group uh, functions. So yes, there's individual um, uh, differences that we have to uh, take into account. That's part of this very complex uh, um, uh, picture. So I am uh, coming to an end here. Uh, so, at the Evolution Institute, uh, we definitely, I've been studying econ economics writ large for a long time, and for the last five years, really honing in on, on uh, the business uh, uh, school and um, uh, the business uh, environment. So basically, this is where now I'm an aspirant to, to your line of, uh, your line of uh, uh, work. Uh, I want to emphasize that there's many applications of evolutionary thinking to workplace environments. We've been focusing on pro-sociality cooperation, but there's many, many others, uh, including this architecture. I mean, isn't it interesting? I've been learning about this building. <laughs> I guess it's common knowledge that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Mr. Hogan here is not so happy with the, uh, you know, the whole open space stuff and, and you know, all of these great questions about the architecture. I mean, this is the human-built environment. This is called niche construction, niche construction. Now, we all live in niches, and humans are geniuses at constructing their own niches, but how well does that, does, that, does that go with us as biological beings, as biological beings? Everything from the lighting to whether we're put into groups, our degree of privacy, you name it. There is, uh, I think, an evolutionary uh, connection. So this is so rich to explore all aspects of the workplace 
environment from an evolutionary perspective, including mismatches and pro-sociality, and, and, and not to speak of cultural change. Uh, I've just recently been reading research on uh, uh, organizational survival. Uh, how long do corporations last? And it's astonishing when you think of it, is that of all the Fortune 500 companies uh, uh, from 30 or 40 years ago are fewer surviving today, when they have all of the resources at their command. So there's a huge difference in how well you're adapted to your current business match and how capable you are of adapting to new business niches. And it turns out that, that most business groups, although they might do well at what they're currently doing, they do terribly at evolving. So the idea that an organization can be adaptable in addition to well adapted, if it has another set of design principles, is something we really need to think about. And yes, there are good examples. There are good examples of adaptable organizations that we can learn about and we can help to uh, help to uh, um, implement. So, pro social world is uh, what we're uh, trying to to do, uh, and uh, maybe that can come out in the uh, in the uh, Q and A, basically. So, we're trying to take these principles and to work with groups, um, including but not restricted to business groups, just like you are, but with another toolkit. And actually, that's probably the best way to end. And uh, thank you very much. Questions? Well, I've been. Oh, we have a question here, right? Sorry. Yes. And maybe this is related to this toolkit from a post social standpoint. So, when you show such strong correlations between the core principle design and performance. Like how do you consult businesses when they are low on one of these and have specific intervention strategies if you're low on the authority to self-govern or the other ones? Yes, we do. So basically what we do with the group is we get pre-data. The pre-data includes uh, in, uh, individual and group variables. One of the most important individual variables, and actually group variables, is flexibility. It turns out that psychological flexibility is something that can be measured. And if you have it, then, I mean, it basically you're adaptable. If you don't have it, then you're stuck doing what you're doing, and there's, and there's ways to increase your psychological and organizational flexibility. So a big part of ProSocial is actually that part, and it's borrowed from this therapeutic literature. Then there's a review of the core design principles, which basically results in an evaluation, and it's a self-evaluation. And it's at that point that every member of the group is asked, first they're introduced to the core design principles, and they're asked three questions. Number one, do you understand it? Number two, do you think it's important for your group? Number three, do you think your group is implementing it? And so you get a report um, in which each individual contributes separately, and then that becomes the basis for what you might for what you might do. Now, as to how receptive the uh, group will be, that will depend. But I think that I'm, this might be what you're driving at: is that often the main problem with a group is the leadership, and the leadership has and wants to keep control. Basically, wants it to be autocratic, and it's at that point that you might get a problem. Okay. And yet, there's other groups that are really into this, and uh, and um, and the leadership uh, is uh, is more than willing to to go along with it. But I think that's probably what you were driving at. Yeah. Is there a hierarchy, universal hierarchy, to the core design principles in terms of what is most necessary to group to function effectively? That's a great question, and and uh, we think the first one is like. If you don't have the first one, a strong sense of identity and purpose, then, then uh, not much else is going to work for you. Uh, the next uh, six are sort of internal. If you remember them, there were basically fair distribution of costs and benefits, a fair decision-making process, mo monitoring, all of that kind of stuff. So that provides a kind of an internal physiology for the group. You might say those are equally important. Uh, for example, uh, and, and they're not just additive, 
So like, if you have like uh, graduated sanctions, but you don't have monitoring, you know, you need A plus B, you don't need, it's a, uh, and then number seven and eight have to do with your relationship with other groups. And so at that point, then that we have to deal with the group as not as 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 not only internally pro-social, but as also a pro-social actor in a larger multi-group uh, environment. Does it have local autonomy? Does it have elbow room to do what it wants to do collectively? And what are its relations with other with other groups? So there's the division. Number one is like paramount. Two through six are internal and seven through eight are external. Yeah. Do you see like a prevalence uh, of something like um, resignations, like not forced resignations, but like choice resignations as a marker of group health in this, possibly? So people saying, I'm not leading the group effectively, so someone else might take it over? I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I don't have like a, you know, a, a prepared answer for it. I do know that uh, we were talking about this during lunch, that if you imagine a, a, a business, for example, uh, implementing these really well, then there's cost required. And so does that place them at a competitive disadvantage? And I was saying no with examples, for example, from B Corps, and, uh, in which uh, they invest a whole bunch in their employees, for example. And for that reason, they become stronger, not, not, uh, not weaker. So I would think turnover in general is an indication that the group is not, is not working very well. Uh, but if somebody's not working well in a position, which is kind of what you guys are dealing with all the time, what you do, whether you would basically you result in staff turnover or whether you work with those individuals, I don't know. That would be, I mean, but a great question. You cannot remain silent any longer. Uh, <laughs> well, we, 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 we started a kind of a line of research that's very closely related. Peter Drucker famously said, culture needs strategy for breakfast every time. That is to say, you, no matter what kind of a strategy you have in place, if your culture is toxic or in, 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 uh, dysfunctional, then you're still not going to be able to implement your strategy. So, so that, I, I think that's true. The question is, what are the elements of culture? Uh, and obviously tried to answer that, but uh, I think it's, so I thought, well, it's, uh, and, and there are all these existing commercial commercial culture surveys, but they're all what I call descriptive. Somebody's made up a list of desirable attributes and then said, what you really have is, and I thought, why not do a prescriptive cultural survey that is, study highly effective groups, find out what values they have in common, and then use that as a basis for your survey. And I think in your in your design principles, you might have uh, what it's starting to look like. I mean, these are different kinds of groups, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and then they, and all, but all along the same continuum of effectiveness or performance. Yeah. So case. that would be a great start. And yeah. when we add the adaptable piece, I think there's a whole set of considerations about not just the culture of an organization, but its capacity for cultural evolution. Yes. Its capacity for cultural evolution, and for that, if you break evolution into three components, there's a target of selection. There's variation that's oriented around the target, and then there's the replication of best practices. Yeah. If you can imagine working on each of those components, then each of those has to be systemic. This is one of the things that multi-level selection uh, tells us. You can't rely on just you know lower level things working at the higher level. So there has to be a target of selection. That so so that might be the mission statement or or something like that. But it's the whole system that needs to evolve. Variation has to be oriented around that target. That requires work. And then identifying best practices require work because of indirect consequences, basically. In a, in, a, in a complex organization, if you do something new, there's going to be all these indirect effects that you have to, in order to know, to be able to chart. And then you have to be able to implement that. And as it turns out, when you survey the business and management literature, you find not one but numerous examples of corporations of companies that do that well. A Toyota is one that famously does it well with their and-on um, uh, systems. Every little dysfunction gets signal, results in a swarm of activity and implementing, so on. There's a, uh, a business change method called Rapid Results that uh, um, uh, actually hardly anyone has heard of it when I when I asked, but it's actually is modeled on the formation of 
of, of small teams. And so basically, small teams are formed to, to address a, a given uh, objective, and they're given a lot of elbow room. And uh, the power of the small group, you know, the power of the small group, take, take a, a small group of people, give them the elbow room to do something, and let it be important, and they spring to life. That this started, uh, it's an interesting story. The idea for this came, it was a business consultant, and he was uh, advising an oil refinery that went on a wildcat strike. And so for a period of months, a few hundred middle managers had to operate this whole refinery that was typically run by, by um, 3,000 people. And do you know that not only did they do it well, but they regarded it as a peak psychological experience. And this is true for those that go to war, uh, such as my own father, is you know war for them, it was the worst of times, but it was also the very best of times because it was life and death. That, I mean, the whole psychology of it was, and that's what had been brought out here. So this business consultant was looking at this and he said, how can I bottle this on an average day? And so what he did was he set up these, this situation where he took a challenging objective for the company, like doubling the sales for a product line or something like that. Get a team with just the right people, which would mean not just the top management, but everyone that's involved in the whole thing. So that was egalitarian. Cut them all sorts of slack about how they go about it, and then let them go to uh, work. And do you know he succeeded? They sprang to life, they regarded it as a peak experiment, experience, and then he could also use this not just on a one-off basis, but as a, as a larger change method, because most business change methods are some kind of grand plan that, that uh, you attempt to impose top-down and seldom works. But here what you could do is you could just do things in a more incremental fashion, increment, implement them one by one, and then that was a little bit like Toyota, basically, implementing its practices one by one. And so uh, as you look across the business literature, what you find is many of these, because they work, they spread to a degree, and yet they also come up against cultural boundaries beyond which they're unknown. And so Toyota, famous in some quarters, totally unknown in others. Rapid results, actually mostly uh, unknown. And so this is what you expect from cultural evolution. This is like so many different experiments and like unmanaged cultural evolution, which are producing these, these successful arrangements. They do spread, but then they come up against boundaries. They're, they're stated in languages that nobody other speaks. You get all of these kinds of things. So what needs to be done is we need to have a more general vocabulary for talking about these things, and that's precisely what evolution provides. Yes? Um, I wonder if you've done any research looking at um, generational differences in social sociality. And I just wondered that because I think it was Deloitte a few years ago came out with surveys talking about the kind of social sociality that they were seeing in the workplace and how that kind of reflected the kind of things that were happening in the workplace. And I just wondered if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think the Well, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I, I would say that, yes, there's generational differences, but those, those are, might more useful, be, usefully be thought of as cultural differences. And if they're generational, so, but basically they're, they're, they're culturally the different generations. One of my most valued colleagues is Jonathan Haidt, who's a social psychologist who actually moved into a business school environment at uh, NYU Stern School. And, uh, and for the last three years, he's been concentrating on what he calls the coddling of the American mind. That's a book that he has, which is a best-selling book. And it's basically that uh, some, something about the rent, what is it, Gen Z that we call it now, um, has been raised that has 
caused them to become exceptionally fragile. And this too has an evolutionary story behind it, which is so very interesting that if you look at child development in traditional cultures around the world, what you find is, is that kids tend to grow up and they interact primarily with other kids. They run around in mixed age groups. They do a lot of learning from older kids. It's in a safe, overarching environment. So that means that they don't have to know helicopter moms and, and dads. And they learn primarily from each other. The older kids want to be adults. It's the only game in town. The younger kids want to be like older kids. There's something about mixed age interaction which brings out the nurturance and tamps down the bullying. So isn't it interesting that if you have a group of like 14 year olds, that's going to be competitive. But if you embed a 14 year old in a group with an 18 year old and a six year old, then that's going to bring out the, the nurturance. And every culture has a tremendous amount of information that must be transmitted. And in most cultures, there's very little that resembles formal education. And self-regulation is taught in this fashion. And play emerges. Unstructured play emerges as a huge, because if you want to play, and if you're not very good at it, then nobody wants to play with you, and you have to modulate your behavior. And so executive functioning and social functioning is something that gets worked out during unstructured play. So what happens if you grow up in a modern environment and all of your activities in school are not like that? And frankly, all of your activities outside of school are not like that either. Then you get dysregulated. And that might be what we're experiencing today. And according to, to, to John, uh, he's getting back into the, the business context because these, 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 these dinoxers, this is now showing up in college, right? <laughs> That's why Brett Weinstein, who I mentioned at the beginning of this, was at Evergreen College. He was drummed out. It was because of being politically uh, incorrect. And now John's saying, guess what, business corporations? These guys now are graduating, and all of the problems that were associated in, in, in college are, are about to become your problems, are about to become your problems. And so isn't that, uh, that uh, that interesting. So yes, there's cultural differences. If you remember the book Bowling Alone by uh, Robert Putnam about basically the importance of small groups, huge generational effects. Our grandparents were much more civic-minded than uh, today's generation, in part because of this individualistic culture that has turned everything now into basically a, a variety of self of self interest. So that's generational, but it's also something which can be repaired if we're smart about it. And then that's a matter of cultural evolution. That's, that's like really, we have to manage the cultural evolutionary process. And that means how about an explicit variation and selection process, which, hap which happens in rapid, rapid cycles. That will not self-organize. That's why we have to be, be basically uh, manage the cultural evolutionary process. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in as a psychologist is uh, who likes to work with whom and who works well with whom. And um, from a multi-level selection um, kind of a, approach, you could try to look at uh, what the ideal personality uh, set is to have on a team. Who, what kind of team, or what personality characteristics of the individuals making up the best team? And to be general characters, everybody should be somewhat extroverted, everybody should be somewhat agreeable. What about the individual members? Are you aware or have you, have you looked into this in terms of uh, the, the, the composition? Of the team? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a that. great topic, and, um, and there is a literature on it. I actually had a, a PhD student do uh, a set of studies with the game of 20 questions, played as individuals and as groups. And it turned out that the best individual players did not function well in a group. Content. Uh, <coughs> we have very deep questions. First of all, I think a pro-social orientation is important. Sure. Um, when it comes to individual differences, some are not worth wanting. <laughs> just disruptors, you know. It's not as if they're playing some goal. Or, no, they're just not worth wanting. 
And at the same time, a group that works well, often diversity is extremely important. And a, a really great study of this uh, um, a person on this is a guy named Victor Kwan, who is currently uh, a vice president of the Kaufman Institute, which is all about entrepreneur, all about entrepreneurship. And he wrote a book called The Rainforest, which is um, very um, uh, informed by evolution. He asked the question, what, makes, what, what is it that makes Silicon Valley and, and other places so vibrant as entrepreneurial communities? What do they have that everyone else would like to have? And everyone's trying. Right? Everyone wants to create an entrepreneurial zone, and yet most of the time it fails. So what's the secret sauce? And the secret sauce is a combination of cooperation and diversity. And diversity, because in order to innovate, you do need the diversity, the task, and so on and so forth. And what's typically is where we cooperate with people that are like us, and we don't cooperate with people that are unlike us. And so what you have to do is you have to have a novel kind of a cultural form which allows people that are different from each other to be highly cooperative. And if you look at places like Silicon Valley, you actually find that. Also Israel, why is Israel called the innovation nation? According to some people, it's because of the military. And the military throws all kinds of people, Israelis of course, it excludes other people, Israelis together, they're different, but they now become unified through their military experience, and then they go off and they and they innovate. So what's what's uh, what's needed? And knowing that, you can actually take steps in order to take individuals that are different and give them an identity. Basically, that involves working on core design principle one, and it's perfectly possible to do that. So, anyhow, yeah, there's a partial answer to your question. So, so some combination of of diversity, also diversity proportional to the task. Yeah. And a point that I haven't made yet is that in addition to the core design principles, which we call them core because they're needed for cooperation in all their forms, there's also auxiliary design principles, which are needed by some groups but not others um, uh, for their particular task. And so it's not as if it's all, you know, one yeah. size fits all. And so the right kind of diversity would be, I mean, that question as to what is the best kind of diversity would uh, would differ, I think, depending upon that. I think the key concept there is going to be complementary. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not all about similarity. It's uh, complementary. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. bringing out the best in the other. Yeah, that's right. And I think that, uh, yeah, so anyhow, absolutely. Okay, I think we better uh, stop there. Um, we we'll stay around for a few more minutes and we can ask maybe some other sure. questions if other people want to do that. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. And <laughs>